Hey, this is DJ Native Wayne Smoking, and I have someone I want to introduce to you. In Jamaica, ER doesn't mean emergency room. It means earnest wrangling. Except, after watching his fingers on the guitar, he might need a little resuscitation. Hailing from the tiny island of Jamaica, Ernie helped his homeland to become one of the most influential forces in the world of music, culture, and revolution. Shaping this movement was the brilliant innovator, master maestro Wrangling, the greatest guitar player that you never heard of, but who influenced everyone. You know Ernie Wrangling? Why? Sly Ernie Wrangling, one of the wickedest guitarists you have in Jamaica. Ernest is the greatest musician ever out of Jamaica. Jamaica's produced some pretty incredible musicians, um, jazz musicians, a, a lot of them. Um, but I think Ernest is really the best. Ernie's parents did not want him to become a musician, fearing he would end up destitute and homeless. My family was against what I was going to do mm -hmm. because looking at most guitar players, you know, in the country, I was born in the country, and the only guitar player you would see is maybe like after hours he's coming from the bar and he's drunk, you know. So they figure more or less that if I try to play a guitar, Maybe that's how I'll end up. At 14, I'm self-taught, you know. Mm -hmm. So I bought books, and from there I started. I've played from many, many books, tutors, book, you know. And um, I used to, in my young days, I used to like when I found out that Parker had book, Charlie Parker, and like books uh, that Dizzy Gillespie has, and people like those. I decided to really learn the thing properly. And one good thing, I had a good ear. So I could, uh, in the meantime, I could listen to people like Benny Goodman, Char you know, with Charlie Christian, um, Lionel Hampton. And then I started to hear people like uh, Dizzy and Charlie Parker, who are my main favorite until today, you know. Those people, uh, you know, influenced me a lot. And at about 16, well, they say that I was the number one guitar player for Jamaica. I started off with a group, um, Val Bennett. Yes, so that was my first gig, and then I eventually played into that band as a regular member. Was that the first one you got paid for? Uh, well, <laughs> pay that is another question. <laughs> At the early age of 19, Ernie started hanging around Alpha Boy's home was the only place on the island to get a real musical education. Run by Sister Ignatius, it helped produce the godfathers of Jamaican music, the Scatellites, Don Drummond, and Roland Alfonso. I used to go around all these schools and, you know, practice with them, you know. I would go to Stone Hill sometimes, and I would go to Sister out at um, uh, Alpha and practice with them too. So Sister got to know me, you know, and. So Eric Deans was my band leader, and he's from Alpha. He gave me a lot of encouragement when I was with Eric, Eric Deans' band, you know. When Eric, when Eric wasn't around, we, we'd we have a lot of jam sessions. So he's one of my tutors. And Eric Deans said to me, well, sister likes you a lot. Why right? don't you go and ask her, you know? So I went, for, I went and asked her for those four guys. And I saw Dan Germans, um, 
Ruben Alexander, Blue Buchanan, and Don Germans, all those guys. That's how they came into the band with Derek Jeans with me. So we grew up as young boys together. We were the first set that went to Haiti. We came back playing the, the, the mambo and, and the um, merengue. We were the first band that came to Jamaica and played that type of music. We used to have shows every two weeks. And this was a very good opportunity for me because uh, you have people from coming from America here doing Broadway shows. Mm -hmm. And um, people from Cuba, people from all over England, every kind of, you know, artists come here. Roughly what year was that? Uh, this was about 50, about 1950, going to 51. There were no jazz clubs really in Jamaica other than um, in a hotel environment, whether around the hotel bar or the hotel restaurant or something like that. At that time, I used to play in the hotels because, uh, you know, I, my main thing was playing standards and so forth. I love standards, you know. If you went out to any, um, in, any clubs or little um, bars, or, or clubs, I would say, which were mostly um, within hotels at the time, you would hear jazz, or you would hear Latin music, Cuban music. You heard a lot of Cuban music. That, that, that was jazz time. We, we didn't come to scare that time. It was for jazz. Jazz was the first element, you know. You know, that's what we play at hotels and so forth. So they, like, they are like a road band. So they go out, you know. So I work in the studios in the days and in the nights. I go and play what I like to play. <laughs> At the time, the music that was very popular in Jamaica was mostly from America, mostly from New Orleans. A lot of people who did, who did these things. Louis Prima was one, mm -hmm. um, Bill Duggett. Mm -hmm. uh, I loved Louis Jordan, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of these people, and we, we listened to these uh, rhythm and blues. Scatolites, for instance, as a band, they were influenced, they started their, influ their music really by listening to bebop, for instance, from Dizzy Gillespie, and uh, that's where the trumpet riffs that you hear from Dizzy Chani, or uh, uh, Don Drummond, who was a famed uh, trombonist, but he, the music would be something that would have come from the bebop movement to the 30s and the 40s. Somebody like Fats Domino, for example, was a was hugely popular in Jamaica. And his style of uh, playing had a kind of shuffle sort of rhythm to it. The shuffle rhythm yes. is where we got this ska, ska beat from. I think ska really sort of emerged from um, that, that shuffle rhythm, except the, the accent started to be more on the off than on the on beat. We decided to make it something out of it. And we said, well, instead of going on the down beat, we have the em emphasis on the second beat of the bar. Oh. The scab business is the half beat, you know. Yeah, we started the half beat with with, with Cloet and Ernest. They, they were the first ones in the, in the scab, really. Jump, jump, jump. It's into the jump, 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 right? At first, I didn't, I didn't get it. You know, it was like, wait a minute, everything's backwards. You know. Rest, quiver, rest, quiver, rest until you have the. Eight notes in the bar. One, two, three, four. You see? Yes. That is the four four beats. Yes. All right. tune that was ever done was Easy Snapping with Phyllis Beckford. I asked if they could put this tune on the B-side. They didn't anyway. And um, it's, it's entitled Silky. Well, I've never seen this tune or heard of it until I was in Japan, 1991. Someone came to me and said, could you autograph this record for me? When I look, Silky. <laughs> That's the first I knew about it. I mean, being out, you know, 
So, but that was really a record that I, a tune that I did to mark the beginning of this rhythm that we were doing. At the beginning, the early days of reggae, people would never play it on the radio and if you wanted to hear it, you'd have to come to Western Kingston. The Japanese invention of the transistor radio made an incredible contribution because before that, uh, ordinary Jamaicans who didn't have a big battery powered radio would have to listen to the one radio station, RJR, Radio Jamaica, And from there on, the, the thing was getting hotter and hotter every day because Duke Creed, we would go down to Duke Creed, do a lot of recordings. And he was one of the main rivals, Duke Creed, but um, King Edwards and all of these greater guys, you know. A lot of guys and the, the music really got uh, good and um, competitive, let's put it that way. The music was heard by the people immediately after we did the session, you know, and the people. We, we became popular amongst the public because our music was played in the dance hall, you know, and, and, and the people loved it, you know, loved it. You know. Studio One in Kingston was Jamaica's Motown and brought us most of Jamaica's musical giants. Ernie started there in the early 60s with famed producer Cox and Dart. Together they would produce some of the most influential music in history. I was really the arranging man for Studio One. So the owner called me and um, which is dad, called me and um, asked me if I could do this, L we call it LP in those days, uh, for Jackie Opel. So it took me about, maybe about two weeks to do this thing for him. So when everything was over, you know, the band was still there, you know, I said, but guys, it's like we're a family now, you know. So this guy, Lord Tanimo, a singer, he said, yes, why not, let's keep this band together, you know, and that's where they, you know, that's how it started. And that's how the band came together as the Scatterlights. The Scatterlights were the studio band on many of the records, even some of the rhythms you hear today, they were the studio band for that. And he influenced many of those guys, gave many of them their first opportunity. He uh, was able to do the transition from jazz, uh, progressive jazz, that uh, you would have had coming out of New York in the, the 40s and 50s. He was a transition from that period and was a good interpreter. Wes Montgomery, who is another great jazz guitarist, said there's a guy in Jamaica, he doesn't know if he has 16 fingers or what, but his name was Ernest Ranglin. He was the first person who I'd ever heard play, you know, octaves uh, at the same time on the, on the, uh, on the guitar. Later on, uh, West Montgomery became known for that, but Ernest was really the first one I'd ever heard play on that. He knows what it is and the effect that it has to play loud, to play medium, to play soft. You know, I think he, he understands even the effect it is it can have in healing people in the, in his mu with his music. If Cox and Dodd produced Jamaica's first music, it was Chris Blackwell who helped bring it to the world. With his groundbreaking island records, he shaped an everlasting legacy. I came back to Jamaica um, in the mid-50s, and I was really looking to see what jazz there was in Jamaica. And there were quite a good a few players in Jamaica at that time, good mu jazz musicians. But the person who really stood out for me was, uh, was uh, Ernest Ranglin. And um, he was really unknown outside of Jamaica. I just felt, you know, if Ernest came to England, I might, I might be able to get him going. Chris asked me to go to England. So I went to England, that was 64. So I took Ernest along to uh, Bonnie Scott's and I spoke to Pete King, who was the manager, and I said, look, uh, this is my friend from Jamaica. He's a really, really, really great guitarist, really quite something. Uh, I'd love for you to let him uh, sit in. You know, he said, oh, well, okay, okay, you know, but he didn't seem too interested. And then after about half an hour, you know, they stopped their set. So I said, well, when they do the next set, can he play? They said, oh, okay, well, we'll see, we'll see. So rather reluctantly, they let him get up and play. And, uh, 
and he played and about after about a couple of minutes the whole club fell completely silent you know and then at the end of the first song there was literally a standing ovation the whole place just came completely alive it was just one of those really great moments where you know they didn't really want him to play in the first place but after he'd played it was just it was all over you know in 1964, there was a record that uh, became sort of a hit. Maybe it was a, sort of a novelty hit, but it was, you know, it was a, it was a rock hit uh, in America called "My Boy Lollipop" by Millie Small. You know, one of the greatest thing we do is is we arrange "My Boy Lollipop" to you. Know, yeah. Millie Small, yeah. Well, so, number one guitarist in the world. Yeah, the best thing, man. One Sunday morning, we were going to Brighton because you know uh, the the. the, the the climate, sometimes, you know, it's so rainy and so damp. And this Sunday it was very nice and it was sunny. So we decided that we'd go to Brighton at, by the beach, you know, and on the way um, she started to sing this tune and I started to figure, you know, hum some parts of the arrangements that I would put behind her. And um, so when we reached, um, Brighton, it was almost finished. And so when we came back, I just went straight home. I started to do the arrangement. And by Monday morning, we were in studio, and that's how we recorded it. I went over with Ernest, different ideas for it and everything. And Ernest wrote the arrangements for it and, and, played, on the, and played on the record. There was no market for Jamaican music at that time, but I felt it sounded like a hit. I felt certain it was a hit. He knows what he wants, you know, and um, he could explain, you know, to you and tell you. And, he, you know, as a, a good businessman, he knows the business good too. And because before Millie got her, her hit, he said, you know, if this, if, Millie, if this tune becomes a hit for Millie, it's going to last her about 10 years as a one tune. Then, you know, there are tunes, if she makes it after that, then she'll be going on, you know, with that one hit. And so done, that's what really happened, you know. He was really right on the, on the, on the ball with that. It was actually really my first big hit. It was a, it was a record that sort of catapulted me into the regular sort of... Uh, music industry, because up until that I was purely working in the Jamaican music area. That was actually the first big hit for Island Records. There's one thing about it that I really have to remember, yes. is that there was the only Jamaicans that was on that record. This um, Pete Peterson, a trumpeter, mm -hmm. and myself, the guitar player. Mm -hmm. But all the rest of musicians, were Englishmen, and this is the first they're going to play ska. Oh, oh. So they, I mean, they don't know what is ska, oh, right? See, that's amazing. Even when this was just new in Jamaica, also, right? And so I went over there, and these guys, horn players, uh, bass player, drummer, <laughs> well, they all played ska, and that was the first ska that was played in England. So I heard uh, the Millie Small record, My Boy Lollipop, in 64. And then I noticed uh, there was a Beatle, rec a Beatle song called I Call Your Name. And in the bridge, they go into that, that ska beat. What I know about that song is that it happened to sort of be a larger hit in some territories than the Beatles were, which is pretty amazing when it came out. And uh, I know that um, it kind of opened the door for reggae to happen. Perry Hensel was the Caribbean's first media pioneer. He started out making commercials in Jamaica for Jamaicans, and then moved on to his landmark triumph film, The Harder They Come. I used to do a lot of commercials for Perry, you know, long before The Harder They Come. That's where I had to do the soundtracks for, for the commercials on there. So that's when I used to go down to the studio and see all you guys. You know, I remember, if, I don't know if you remember, I used to do some of your advertisements for him. That's right. Yeah, man, no, he used to be up at what you call that road. West King's House Road. Right, right. It was a very, very fruitful period, wasn't it? Oh, yes, great, man. I, you know, um, every time I really have to say that 
I'm really thankful that I was born in a certain era. Yes. I was living in Edgewater, and that's when I'm, um, somebody came to me about Jimmy. And um, I joined his group about 1973, somewhere about there, and um, until about 76. We did a few recordings together, with myself and um, other recordings that I did with Joe Higgs. When we played on them, he played an album for me, and that, so we did that. Jimmy was very good at finding bands. He found his backing band was, was, uh, was the band that became Program Harum. Ernie and I toured for a number of years. We toured a lot of countries all over the world, you know, Japan, Europe, US, and all of that for quite a few years. I did tours with him, you know, Japan. I think that's the first time that, that reggae music ever been to Japan. Once I cast Jimmy for the, for the role of Ivan, and in fact, before that, I started, and maybe, maybe I largely cast him because I like his records so much. But remember, Struggling Man and all those early records, oh, yes. you know? I don't know if you... Did you work on them at all? Yes, yeah. I did a lot of stuff with them. Yeah, yes. and Struggling Man was huge, huge, huge in, um, in Nigeria, for example. You know? So that's what they really do. They, in fact, they call him Struggling Man. He got his, his um, OD from the harder they come. That was 1973. Well, we were the first two guys that got OD because I got OD for my works that I did in England with Millie Small and so forth and for what I did to this country in general. In Jamaica, the highest honors are the OM, the Order of Merit, and the OD, the Order of Distinction. These are the equivalent of the British knighthood, the OBEs, and the MBEs, which the Beatles received. I guess the Jamaican authorities didn't realize that OD also means overdose. But in Ernie's case, it only means an overdose of musical genius. Ernie received his Order of Distinction in the early 70s along with Jimmy Cliff. So I got my OD too and um, Jimmy got his OD that same year. So we were, the, we were the first guys from 1973. That's when I first heard uh, reggae music for the first time. I think there was uh, this movie, The Harder They Come, was playing at a theater in Cambridge. I think it was playing there straight for, for five years. I guess he collected royalties over so many years. There are some theaters that wasn't closed at all for years doing the harder they come in Broadway and places like that. Everything was really bubbling over at that time. And the tunes that they used were the tunes that were really popular during that time, like some of the other tunes that they used in the background. And so um, that was just a very, just very choose the right time to do those tunes. And I guess even the harder they come because it was a story and this great gunman, and I don't know if he uh, really was a great gunman in a sense, but a bad man. <laughs> and um, they call him Reagan, you know, and he used to give the police a lot of trouble, you know. They, they say he was a great man with his gun, he could write all his name with his gun and all those things. <laughs> This house was built by a rebel man. <laughs> this house was built by one of the guys that chopped off the head of the King of England. Oh, yes? Yeah, Charles I. Hmm. When Cromwell had the revolution, you know? Yes. And uh, it's about six of his buddies wow. signed the thing to say, chop off the head of the king. Go! <laughs> and um, of course, when the second king came back, he had to get out of England. Oh. So he came to Jamaica, and Jamaica was captured by Cromwell, of course. We're looking at a picture of the three founding members of the Whalers. And that's Bob Marley, Bunny Whaler, and Peter Tosh. The missing person is Junior Braithwaite. And Ernest 
This is what they looked like when you first encountered them. How did you first meet them? Well, um, Richard is a pianist. I think he was a guy who was rehearsing them. And he brought them to me. And um, this is the first time I'm going to see them as a group. Mm -hmm. And um, But the leader was, you can see that he was really going to be a leader. It's uh, Bob, you know. He was the one who was he's, he's in charge of doing the tune. So I started it with them and it was entitled The Church to be Alone. The tune, there was no beginning of the tune in a sense and there was <laughs> no ending. <laughs> And so I fill in certain spaces and they come back again, you know, and that's how I did it and eventually it became a hit. So I said to myself, you know, this guy is going to be a great guy, you know. I could see that from that, you know, from that young guy there. And I knew that that guy was going to be great, <laughs> you know. The first time I hear running around, you know, it's when I tune him. It's hurts to be alone one day. Or even more, every guitar playing in a Jamaica track, play about a solo, I play a lick then. Still, some get it all right, but not right. It hurts to be alone. What a track. I think that was like months and months and months on the, on the radio. Um, we had a party. The Vagabonds, who went to, to London to promote Skia, Colson Chen, Jimmy Jim, Mackerel, mm -hmm. Conference Miller, we went there to promote Skia. And we lived in this one house, and at the bottom we had a party. And this, um, the sax player girlfriend came and she, she played It Hurts to Be Alone. So when I hear it, I said, no. I said, no. I went, so when it's finished, I went over to the dance set, a little dance set, and I take it and I put it in my waistcoat pocket. And I said, I'm going to borrow this for a long time. It was with Bob and Junior Bradford singing Lead and and that was I mean, it was earnest, and it's like it was it was a killer. I mean, I've heard so much of him, but his 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 choice and notes and his feeling just killed me. With so much people come into the studio sometimes that the producer always tell the artist that we're not ready for you yet. You should go and practice more, and especially they used to tell Bob Marley and, and the Wheelers that they should go back and practice. I did about four um, reggae tunes for him. Away from it hurts to be alone. And uh, well, after that, I did some of his things too, but um, it was by Lee Scratch Perry. And um, some of the rhythm section works I used to do, but I didn't know it was for Bob, you see. <laughs> that sound started to sort of really pick up where the kind of the accent was a little different from what you heard from America. I don't know why or why it happened like that, but it just kind of caught like that and it sounded fresh and it sounded different and then everybody really developed that. When I heard the Barrett brothers and, and, uh, and Peter Tosh and, 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 and Bob Marley, uh, I knew that it was great. You know, I knew I was hearing greatness. I actually heard reggae before I heard ska, because uh, when I was a kid, my parents we were playing a lot of uh, reggae from Jamaica um, in the early 70s, the mid 70s. And then later on when I became a teenager, I started hearing the older ska stuff. And then after, after that, that's when I got into some of the British ska. And you know, that's how what kind of, uh, all of that together kind of helped no doubt make our sound. Ernest and reggae music really influenced me as a young kid growing up. Um, Obviously, he's one of the founding fathers and the foundation of reggae music. All the stuff that he did with uh, during the Studio One times and with the Whalers and Bob Marley. Bob has been an icon for a long while. And he still is. I mean, his memory, he, everything lives after him. And it's really going just the same way. Bob has a strong um, influence on the world. Uh, a man of well, I think I'm trying to put humanity together, you know, um, in a, the right way that it should be. These are all my guitars, but I keep trying to 
we condition them all the time. Sometimes it doesn't work out too great and sometimes it comes out. So this one is an Ibanez Jopas model. When I turn it over and if you notice ER because I did the whole neck and did the whole thing all over. And then this is a Charlie Christian Gibson. Where I bought this in Florida about 1985 or so. This was the one that I took to England in 1964. The Melody Maker gave me the number one guitar player for Europe. So this was the guitar that did it. Straight Flush was a fantastic song. I think it was done by Carlton and, and the shoes, and he was really love me tomorrow. And I called to Ernest and tell me he went in and they just um, they pulled down the vice to Ernie, do a thing now. And Ernie just mashed it up. I don't know where he got, where he got it from, but it, the melodic content and the way he played, it was just so fantastic. And that's the one we did with Robbie. Krieger because that was one of Robbie's favorite songs. You know, something like Straight Flush is like what I would love to be able to uh, to do, you know, make it like a hit instrumental. And that's sort of uh, what my goal is. I love working with musicians that have this, this ability to completely be in the musical moment you know, where, where whatever's going on musically is like instantly responded to and you don't, you, you don't, you almost don't have to rehearse. Sometimes rehearsals are actually kind of a, you know, a hindrance because you, you don't have to think about it. You just have to go to that musical space and, and he's very much there. His guitar licks like sing, like almost lyrically, like they're saying things when you hear them. Um, you remember them the same way like Family Man's bass lines, you remember Ernest's guitar lines. He has this great kind of fluid, linear, like melody thing going on, but with, with this great groove underneath it, you know, and it's that combination of the two, of, of great feel and, and very, you know, just spinning out lines of notes. Like you don't hear the thought behind it, it just, you know, just, it moves, you know. And when he plays a solo, he just doesn't play fumble, fumble, fumble. He still plays the solo, but you can still hear the melody because he embellishes the melody. There's a, a, a very natural process in this music. This is not something you learn in school. This is, long, this is something that came about in our lives as we grew up in the islands that we're from. I'm just amazed that, that he's so, he's just, he's as humble and as open as you would expect a new and young musician to be. And with all the experience he has and all of the hits that he's had, um, I don't know, it really, it really reminds me why I do music, you know, and it's one of those things that's like, yeah, that's how you do it, you know? I mean, he continues to inspire people, you know, and probably will forever and ever and ever. If there was a stage show and Ernie Wrangling was at the top of the list, even if you didn't know any other players, you would have inclined to go because his name was associated, it was a gold-plated name. Yeah, well, this is Damien Junior Gang Marley, and we send a special shout out to our Ernest Wrangling, you know. The guitarist will know that helped set the standard in reggae music and lay a foundation for us, the younger ones, the younger generation, to come and uphold. We give thanks to the legacy. Rastafari, I bless. Yeah, like we say, you know, much love and respect to Ernest, you know what I mean? Foundation, elder, patriot. From Ska, Rocksteady, Reggae, Rubber Dub, up to today where we are at Dancehall. All of it is reggae for me. It's just different forms of reggae. <coughs> and so the foundation of it 
Ernest Wrangling was there. The foundation of the, of the music that we formed and established. So, I mean, how much more important can you be? What is amazing is today, here we are, where we're now, we just talked about 1964, that's what, 41 years ago. Ernest still plays. It's, it's unbelievable that Ernest can still play, can have the dexterity that he has in his hands, still to be able to play as he does. He's really gifted. Yeah, the best thing, man, out of Jamaica right now, more respect to Ernie Wrangling. Long live Ernie Wrangling. We big up yourself, Ernie. Player. You know, Sly Robbins says, so big up yourself. You, know, you, you contribute a lot to the music industry. Probably you are a contributor for making Sly Robbins be a musician, so you don't know that. Yeah, man, yeah, I can. Yeah, man. I can have Jamaica music, yeah, Ernie Wrangling. From recording with the Scatilites, Bob Marley and Jimmy Cliff, Ernie continues today, touring constantly and working with such diverse artists as Baba Mal in Senegal, Monty Alexander, Jimmy Buffett, and Michael Francis Spearhead. What can you say about the gentle giant, the humble hero, the master of melody, the wicked wizard? Well, Ernie's wrangling helped us see the world a little more clearly. Wicked respect, Ernie. Thank you.